Okay, so let's do this. Hello, everyone. This is Matuš again here in our podcast called Theory of Money, Theory of Penes. Today, we have another special guest from the United States, Adam Lane Smith. Adam, hello. Hello, Matuš. It's nice to talk to you on here. We have um, like time hard time horizon between us is like seven hours, right? So where are you based exactly? In which city? I am right in the middle of the United States on the top north border on, in, a, in a state called Wisconsin, just nice. on the edge of the river between Wisconsin and Minnesota. So it is frozen here. There was <laughs> snow up to your knees and very, very cold. Wow, this is this is fun. Uh just imagination, you know, like you are so far away and we can we can talk about our our topics today. Uh Adam, you are you are author of books, relationship coach and also also attachment specialist. This is Absolutely. our topics today. I can't wait to get into it. For all our listeners, please follow Adam on Twitter. Uh he has great points and we will try to connect relationships, dynamics between men and women, and also money and finance, which is our main topic. But at first, Adam, what is the attachment style? What does attachment it mean? Attachment styles. Most people have no idea, and it's a secret piece that controls how good your relationships are or how bad they are. So I'm glad you asked me. Attachment is the way that we connect to other people to give and receive love. If your parents taught you to cooperate, to share your needs, to trust, to bond to other people, to be open, you develop what's called a secure attachment style, where you can just talk openly about what you need. You're not afraid. You're not scared. You don't have to manipulate. And that's great. That's secure attachment style. Most people, many people do not have that. Probably half of people do not have that. They have broken attachment. They are either anxious attachment, where they think something is wrong with them on the inside that everybody else can see, and they are insecure and afraid all the time that they're going to be abandoned, they are a fraud, they feel like a fraud, that someone will figure out that they are worthless and abandon them, that everyone will leave them. So they have to make everybody like them and get approval from other people so that people won't leave them or reject them. That's anxious style. Then there's avoidance style, which says everyone else is the problem. Everyone is crazy. <laughs> everyone is selfish. No one's going to help each other. And when it comes down to it, everyone will betray me. So I have to stay away from other people and stay safe. Or some avoidant people say, I got to manipulate and manage other people to make them be good. And this is where a lot of the problems come in the world right here. I have to manage other people to make them be good. And I'm going to be better to them than I assume they would be to me if they got the chance. That's avoidant attachment. And you can be a blend of the two called disorganized, which is you think you're a problem and others are the problem and you can't figure out what to do. You are just chaotic in your relationships. And this, you go into relationships and it's a mess because you can't trust yourself or you can't trust other people or there's one of each. One person doesn't trust himself and the other person doesn't trust anybody and they try to figure out money. They try to talk about money and manage it together as a couple and no one trusts each other or you're stressed all the time so you overspend money or you uh, you work really hard to mass all that money and keep it but you never share it with anyone else and your family goes hungry, your kids go hungry. There's a number of ways that attachment and relationships connect to money but there's a primer for you right there. Thank you. Thank you. This reminds me, I have already mentioned it several times here in our podcast, um, on financial advisor, uh, Brett Klons from the United States. He talks about attachment of money, like different kind of like status attachment, you know, and avoidance, exactly the same. So it is all, all connected. Um, I'm just wondering how you can like fix this, right? Because, okay, many, many listeners maybe right now are thinking, Maybe I'm this, maybe I'm this, I, but I don't know what I can do about it, right? So what would you suggest or recommend? <laughs> oh, I have so many suggestions. So <laughs> I specialize in fixing attachment more than any other problem so that you can have better relationships and connect to people. So I have I have I've built a video course, I have books, you know, everything's on my website, adamlanesmith.com. But one thing I do is I come in and people come in, they hire me as their coach. And the first thing we do, and I'll tell you guys exactly how I fix fix people so you can figure out how to fix your own relationships. They come in and I say, we got to figure out where all your gaps are. 
Where are the problems? What's the belief that's causing the problem? What their style is? Do you think you are the problem and no one will ever love you? Or do you never believe you can trust another human being ever? Which one is it? Because we got to build from there. Then we say, who are three people in your life that you actually trust enough? that you could probably open up to them, but you've been too scared to, and you can tell them how insecure you feel and open up about what you're feeling. And yes, expose how you are, but but also get acceptance from them and test them to see if they can care about you. And this is what stops most people is they're terrified because they think it's going to destroy everything. If they open up and say, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, no one will ever care about me, but I want to fix it, and I want to have love and friendship, they're afraid that the other person's going to go, oh, I never realized that you were unlovable before. Get out of here. Go live somewhere else. And they're afraid they'll be driven out of town, you know, with, por- with t- torches, like a monster. And the other people... Avoidant people say, if I open up and tell people that I'm insecure, or I open up and tell people that I have a hard time trusting, they're going to use it against me somehow. They're going to figure out how to hurt me. I can't open up and be vulnerable. No one wants to help me. And when they open up to three people, the first time your brain says, don't do it, and it's yelling and screaming at you, and you're anxious, panic attacks, and freaking out. And then you open up and connect to that person. You do what I call the I am an anxious person speech. You give that with that person. And they accept you and your brain says, no, this can't, this is something weird happened. This is, this will never happen again. Let's never try it again. Number two, second person, your brain says, well, maybe it's 50, 50, maybe it's just a chance if it's going to work or not. Let's never try it again. And after the third person accepts you, your brain says, okay. And it clicks and says, I've been wrong. Three people now accept me. It has disproven mom and dad who did not give you the connection that you needed. They did not give you the security to say, you can ask for your needs. You can share openly. You can trust. No one's going to hurt you. People will work with you in good faith. It undoes the bad lessons your parents taught you, and it teaches you those good lessons with three people. And then you start leaning into that relationship and testing it and and asking for your needs. Hey, could you do this for me? Is that okay? Hey, hey, what can I do for you? Hey, how can I help? Hey, here's a problem that's coming up for me. Can we fix this together? These things that you can do in relationships that sound crazy, but you can do them and you build that and it rewrites your brain each time and it starts fixing your attachment and your stress goes down and you get all the brain chemicals you need. There's there's big five, um, big five that we really deal with. Oxytocin, the love hormone, bonding, nurturing, the vasopressin hormone. And I think in, in the UK or in Europe, they call it vasopressin. Vasopressin is how we say it here in the United States. Um, vasopressin, which releases when you solve problems together as a team, especially men get, are good for this one. Serotonin, which is a number of places release serotonin, but especially good talks, good conversations, good bonding. Um, you've got GABA, G-A-B-A, gamma amino biuric acid, which releases with the presence of good oxytocin, and it suppresses anxiety and stress and cortisol and all of that. And then you've got dopamine. And most people are low on four of them because their relationships are so bad. All they have is dopamine left, which is binging, which is, re- we call it in the United States, retail therapy, spending money to feel better. I feel pretty sad today. I should spend $500 on Amazon and order all kinds of stuff. That's dopamine binging. And that's right there where attachment really feeds into finances. But when you fix your relationships, instead of one, all of a sudden you're getting all all five brain chemicals in the right amounts again, most likely. And that is going to take care of your brain and heal you. So then you're not dopamine binging all the time. And all of a sudden you spend money more carefully, a little more wisely. You don't need to be spending, you don't have to buy $500 in, in glass unicorn statues to feel better. You can save that $500 and invest it smartly or, or use it on something careful. Um, that's how you fix attachment. And that's also, also how you fix your relationship with money in a big way in many places. That's right there. There's the secret, my friend. Uh, thank you. This is really interesting because this is exactly what Brad was talking about, uh, about, about finance and about finances. That when someone has a problem to spend money, actually, there are some kind of people like those savers, which are anxious uh, when they see their bank account going down, this rewiring the brain with the sentences, or in your example, it was to talking to people. In his case, he was talking, okay, uh, talk to yourself. This is okay. I love this. This will be bring this, this, this. So this is really working, this 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 rewiring, this um, uh, the brain stuff. And I loved your tweet. It was exactly about this topic. Like, Fixing your attachment 
when you are young is like buying Bitcoin at $1, at the price <laughs> of $1. I really loved it. I really love the connection with the money. So it is so true. That is so true. I have so many people come into my coaching and some of them are 70 years old and they've lived for <laughs> 70 years with bad relationships and they hate it. And they've been divorced five times and they have kids who don't want to talk to them and grandkids who won't talk to them. Then they say, okay, Adam, I'm now ready to fix my attachment. And I say, okay, let's fix it. But when I see someone who comes in at 21 years old to fix their attachment, I am so glad that they are skipping that that 50 years of hard life so that they can build good life instead for the next 50 years. It is like buying Bitcoin. It's like buying Bitcoin at one cent yeah. instead of one dollar. It is. It's so big. And what, do, what would you recommend for, let's say, young people, right, who go on dates and mm. after listening to you, they now know, okay, this might be my attachment style. And now they will try to figure out if the person against them, what kind of attachment style it is and how it can work. I don't know. There is there any formula which says if you have this attachment style, you can you can be compatible with this kind of person. Or, you know, I'm just thinking like what this young generation can actually how they, how they can spot it and how they can use it. Be so, 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 so careful when people are dating. Because what tends to happen is people with anxious style who go out there and think they are a problem and no one will ever love them. They go into relationships asking for nothing. These are especially young women and men, but young women who go into relationships pretending they don't want commitment, pretending they are just happy to be there, pretending they are just there to give him good feelings. And he, the guy, will go in with avoidant attachment style. And he will love bomb them. It's what is called love bombing. And it floods you with oxytocin, that love bonding hormone. And it makes them feel so safe and loved and cared for. It's compliments and gifts and kindness. And I love you. And let's get married and all in the first week. And it just fills them with oxytocin and sex as fast as possible. And great sex, because it has to be. And that wears off about six or seven months into the relationship. When it's too good to be true and it's flashy right at the start, it is probably not real. Secure attachment. People who are calm and secure, kind of like they spend more carefully and more smartly. They date more carefully and smartly and they sit back and say, okay, tell me about yourself. They ask deeper questions. What are your good? What are your values? What are your morals? What do you live to? What do you never want to break? What are your good boundaries in life? What boundaries do you have against other people? You know, what, what is how important is real honesty to you, really? And tell me about a time that you had to you you had to it cost you to be honest. It was hurtful for you to be honest, but you did it anyway. Tell me about those times. What are your long-term life goals? Where are you going in life? Are those compatible with me? Can we build those goals together? This is more secure attachment. And they go much slower because they're going to connect for life. It's like founding a business. You don't pick a stranger and build a business together based on feelings. You find real compatibility. If it's all about the feelings and it's really fast, bad sign. And if you are getting suckered in by someone who is just making you feel good, bad sign. Remember that a committed relationship is not, let's commit to giving each other good feelings for 50 years until one of us dies and that one wins, ha ha, the other one now has to lose, live alone. That's not what marriage or commitment is supposed to be. And that's not what running a business is supposed to be either, is let's make all the money we can until one of us dies. It is let's build a sustainable thing that does something great that is there beyond us that fulfills our needs and fulfills the needs of everyone else who's involved and marriage for example is usually the business of children and grandchildren so let's build a family system that is going to last long term even when the feelings aren't great so let's mm -hmm. not rely on the feelings let's build something together that's mm -hmm. what you need to be looking for in dating that's what i teach when people come in for coaching but that's what you need to be doing all the young people listening to this Date as if you are founding a business with that person and be very sincere before you jump into the bed with anybody. Make sure you're compatible first before you cloud those feelings with all kinds of hormones. <laughs> This is very similar, I think, actually to finances when people love to speculate. They love the rush, you know, <laughs> from Bitcoin going up and then down and other cryptocurrencies or stocks or whatever. Instead of having the vision and going for yes. something meaningful, in spending yes. and also in in uh, investing so yes. 
Yeah, this is this is this is nice. Also, you 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 have a very nice tweet for our listeners. Uh, I really I will mention a few of Adam's tweet, and this one goes: Don't go to groceries starving, or go dating starving for oxytocin. So this oxytocin thing is really big, right? It's like yes, it is. Yes, wow. it is. M- most people don't realize it. And it's very, very big for women, especially in the bedroom. A woman cannot have the climax without oxytocin going through her system, usually. Usually. Um, she can't have multiple climaxes without oxytocin. She can't even get aroused without oxytocin, especially as later in the relationship. About 12 months in, it switches all the way to full oxytocin. But oxytocin is good for men, too. It's what makes us feel connected and loved and safe and warm and like somebody cares about us and if you did not receive that as a child then you are going out into the world with an addiction that you don't even know about and if people come in and flood you with that oxytocin they love bomb you and make you feel it on purpose to hook you so that when they back away later you will chase them or they you will put up with anything they put up with it is like an addiction to opium And you are craving it all the time and you will put up with anything. This is why we see people in abusive relationships and say, why do they stay? It's because they're oxytocin addicted and they didn't get it as a child and they don't think they can get it anywhere else. And only this one person is giving it to them. And they think that person's their drug dealer that they have to follow around. You see young women addicted to drugs to drugs and they'll do anything for drugs, opium. And, and oxytocin are very similar in that way, where they will keep you addicted. Men, too. Men do this, too. They'll get addicted to it, to a bad woman who mistreats them, who treats them like garbage, who cheats on him with her friends, who just is just mean to him. And you say, why does he put up with her? Because she oxytocin bonded him at the very beginning. Big, flashy. This is why the big flashy at the beginning is bad. It has to be. And then they will treat you badly later, and you will keep chasing them because you want the drug that you think only they can give you. So when you go dating, starving for oxytocin, you are Mm -hmm. making bad choices. But you're going to make bad choices and grab the first person who love love bombs you with enough oxytocin to feel like you are getting satisfied. And that will keep you stuck. And how is it created? So is it created by someone giving you this first, let's say, compliments or good time? Or how, how, how is it created? It is. So there's, there's, there's a couple of factors that need to be have happening. Um, if you have high cortisol in your system, stress, the stress hormone, high stress, it will usually block the production of oxytocin. So it's harder to get. So you need, the person needs to help you feel relaxed so that your stress level is low. And then because they've helped you feel relaxed, you already like them. <laughs> you already like them. Yeah. And then you start to open up and they give you kindness. You're so kind. You're so smart. I've never felt this way before with anybody. And then they have sex and then, uh, you know, orgasms and things release oxytocin, rubbing on the arm, you know, rubbing on the face, the neck, touching, physical touch, calm, physical touch releases a lot of oxytocin. There's a, a rhythm called pink, pink rhythm, which actually is nice and slow, kind of like this, like a mother rubbing her child's back. That releases oxytocin. Um, all of us, if we were children and we were breastfeeding, we got oxytocin from mom, and mom releases oxytocin while she's breastfeeding. And here in the United States, there's a problem because women who have anxious attachment can't produce enough milk, or it's it's harder for the baby to pull the milk. So the it's the baby starts starving and gets yellow and jaundiced and sick because she has attachment issues. But as you increase that oxytocin, it's easier for the baby to drink. And then the baby gets oxytocin. If you did get not get much oxytocin as a child, it is harder to release it because your oxytocin receptors shift to a different hormone. So it's even harder for you to get it. And it seems even more valuable. So it goes from looking like Ethereum to looking like Bitcoin all of a sudden. And Bitcoin like 2021 Bitcoin, really good Bitcoin, not, not today's Bitcoin, um, which arguably could be the same, I guess. But you know what I mean? It's... That oxytocin, it's released with good physical contact, good love and affection, feeling safe, compliments, kindness, holding hands, good conversation, laughing together, sharing moments together. It's good to release oxytocin with people who are also feeling the same toward you. Keep in mind that people who are avoiding it, 
will not release oxytocin toward you the same way. They are managing you. So they are just playing a game. So they probably are releasing dopamine as they unlock your emotions and make you feel things. They're getting dopamine instead, usually. You are getting oxytocin and the mm. body is only on one side. Hmm. Uh, interesting. I also read some one tweet which, which says something like this. Um, woman wants stable man. Men are stable when they follow a clear internal code that nothing can force them to break. If a man gives it in uh, gives in to external pressure, he is not stable, and only her constant attention and nitpicking will keep him in line. She can never trust such a man. <laughs> and this is, I think, this is really powerful. Arise, right? woman want stable man, and man should have an internal code. So. How are listeners, guys or men, can actually create internal codes for mm-hmm. themselves? So I, I get this question all the time. Men come into my coaching and they say, Adam, I don't like myself. Men don't respect themselves. I don't respect myself and I don't know what to do. And I say, okay, here's your internal code. You already have it. You just don't realize you have it. I'm going to teach you exactly what I teach them. You need to look at the places where you don't like yourself. What things, if somebody, if a man came up to you on the street, and said, hey, Matush, I know you, and I have known you for 20 years, and I need to tell you the truth. I don't think that you are a man who is honest. I don't think you are a man who is loyal. I don't think you are a man who has compassion for others. I don't think you are a man who has mercy. I don't think you are a man who loves people. I don't think you are a man of integrity who keeps his word. I don't think you keep your word. The ones that hit the hardest, that ugh, it just feels like a knife in your chest, That is your yeah, what we call principle. That is your value, your moral, your code. I tell men, pick your top two or three. Top two or three principles, values, that moral code. For me, honesty, I have to tell the truth and the whole truth and never lie and also not hold things back from people. I need to give them the truth. Integrity, number two, keeping my word. If I have given my word, I must keep it. If someone thinks I gave my word, I can't just lie to them and blow them off. I have to fulfill it and, and fulfill my integrity and be responsible for it. And number three, compassion. If somebody needs help, I want to give them that help. If someone is hurting, I want to give them that care. Even if they are mean a little bit or, or whatever it may be, even if they need tough love, I will give them what they really need. Those are my three codes of honor. For me, that's my internal. I cannot break them or I will hate myself. Most men with attachment issues break those those pieces and don't even want to look at them and don't even want to think about them. And they say, no, 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 honor is stupid. Men don't need to talk about honor anymore. That's old. That's no, no, no. It, you still feel it. You must live to these principles, these three things that you live to. So you respect yourself. When you f- push back against other people and say, I'm sorry, I cannot do that because that would not be honest. That would not be this. I will not break it. Instead of collapsing into saying, okay, you want me to do that? Well, I don't want you to abandon me. So, okay, I will just lie. Okay, I, I don't want you to hurt me. So, okay, I will just not tell the truth. I, I will just break my word. I just, I will not be nice to someone like I should have. I won't be compassionate. Okay, I, I won't be loyal to my family. I will do what you tell me to do anyway. You hate yourself. And a woman, if you, she is with you, will see you doing that. And she says, look, all it takes is pressure from outside and he has no honor. So anyone can control him, not only with pain, but with pleasure. If another woman walks by, maybe he'll go and be with her and leave our family behind because he doesn't care about values or morals or honor. He just cares about feeling good or bad. That's feelings is all he has. That's bad. And women can't trust a man who runs by feelings. If you have an honor code, right? We say death before dishonor. I would die before I do these things. And if I accidentally do them, I will go and make it right, even if it hurts me. That's a man you can trust. And that is a man women will trust and respect. And if you want a woman who will trust and respect you for life, you must be a man like that who lives to an internal honor code instead of living to pleasure or avoiding pain. Nice. <laughs> this was this, this was eye-opening and I hope for, for many uh, our young listeners, which we have, Mm-hmm. Um, this was really interesting. Also, what is interesting, which really got my attention, and I don't know if you have, if you will have an answer, we can, we can talk about it because <laughs> you always do great. Amazing. <laughs> because we always post on Instagram, some kind of, uh, let's say questions and, 
who should pay for a first date, right? Mm-hmm. Then mm-hmm. how how to mm-hmm. put finances together that uh, women do most of the houseworks and basically. Yep. Yeah, it's like a hidden, hidden like a labor with without any. Yeah, so this kind mm-hmm. of dynamics, and mm-hmm. actually, yes, you have a tweet about this, of course. Adam, <laughs> Adam is in every topic. So studies show the divorce, uh, the divorce rate increases as husband approaches equal levels of housework, and seventy percent of divorces are initiated by women. Why are women more likely to divorce a husband who does equal housework? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. <laughs> so this is a trick. I posted this and people think that I am saying they are the same. They're actually two different pieces, but there's two different pieces here. Number one, the reason that more divorces are initiated by women does not mean that women are less likely and less loyal to jo- in a relationship. Women are more loyal in most relationships than men are. It is that women are more likely to be anxious attachment and men are more likely to be avoidant. So those divorces that happen with women initiating, those women have usually tried for 15 or 20 years to make changes and the man did not take it seriously and keeps telling her, don't worry about it. That's dumb. Don't feel that. That's stupid. You don't really mean that. I don't really want to care. And he doesn't understand or doesn't care. And she has tried for 15 years. Women change for relationships. They will change inside the relationship and hope the man will change to make the relationship better. Men do not change. We don't change for relationships. We don't change so that someone feels good. You and I change for circumstances, facts. We say, aha, this is a circumstance. There's a problem here. I can go solve that problem. And then we change. We don't change things that aren't broken, right? You and me, we don't do that. Women change for that. They are always looking for ways to improve, improve, improve. We look at, okay, that's fine. It's until it breaks. I won't worry about it. I will do this over here. Men don't want to change until the woman says, I am tired from 15 years and now I need a divorce. And she's done. At that point, she is, she, there's no more trying. She's done. And he says, well, wait, I want to try now. And then he's willing to try because now the circumstances have changed. And she says, I can't. I'm too tired. I have given you too many chances. And then they get divorced. And the man goes online and says, my wife divorced me out of nowhere. It was so awful. Women are terrible creatures. And they all gl- cluster together on Twitter, on, on Reddit, and they complain about how evil women are. And then the women come into all my comment sections or they email me and say, I tried for 15 years and now he wants to... So that's usually where that is. Different piece. But yes, divorces, divorce rates also increase as men are more likely to do more pieces of the housework. Now, part of the reason for this might be that more um, non-traditional couples also may not care about divorce as much and may not see divorce as much of a big problem. For them, divorce may be more like, well, we just outgrew each other. It's not a big deal. There's no problem to it. Whereas traditional couples may resist divorce and say, it's awful. People will judge me. And those couples, the the, the non-traditional couples, the man will do more housework. And the traditional couples, the man will do less housework. So these two things are not tied. I tied them together on purpose to see if people would get that. But they are not actually tied. It's just one couple is more likely to get divorced because their values are different from the other couple. But yes, women, 70%, usually because they are so run down by men who just won't care. Usually, that's what that's what it is. Mm. And the next one, I will already jump to another topic. I used mm-hmm. to buy another tweet from you. I used to buy used tires to save money. I spent so much time dealing with flats and was back in the tire shop every month. Would have mm-hmm. saved so much struggle by investing better. Some people apply this same flaw thinking to their relationships. So stop sabotaging, invest. <laughs> right? And this is just, I think, which which basically sums it all, right? Just yes. invest in your relationships. Adam, um, do you sometimes have uh, clients who actually can get on the same page with money? And like one is spender, one is saver, and they try somehow to make it work? Very often, very often couples do that. And sometimes if you bring them to the line, they can match, but it, yes, yes, a lot. How, how you can help them? Or what, do you, what do you maybe can recommend? I recommend making sure attachment is good because you have to cooperate. The problem there is usually that they can't cooperate. So they are trying to feel good with their own plan 
but they aren't agreeing as a team on where the limits are. So there's there should be movement in either direction. The spender should have a little bit to spend and the mm-hmm. saver should have a bunch to save. You should pay, you should it, it doesn't have to be one perfect point for every couple. There should be a gap. Not spending everything and not saving everything. A nice range in the middle where the couple should be able to come in and say, "Look, I want to spend a little bit more. Okay, I want to save a little bit more. Let's work together instead of saying you are bad and you make me feel scared. Let's let's come together and say, okay, what budget can we make? How much spending can we do each month, right? The the person who saves may say, okay, you have $300, $500, whatever they want. You have this amount each month that you can spend. By all means, spend it. I will consider it gone. If you don't spend it, spend it the next month. That is okay. But here is what we cannot touch and we must save. Maybe we have three bank accounts, you know? not We, we all have access, but we have three bank accounts, a saving a, a, a bills account, and then a, a fun account. And we have it in three different areas and you can spend the fun account, go wild. But you have to be able to work as a team to even have this talk. It sounds easy to say, just go have that talk. But they even have to be able to work as a team. Otherwise, the spender will come in and say, well, yours is stupid. You just want to save everything. I don't know why you're thinking that, but I don't really care because it's dumb and you're making me not feel good. I need to spend money when I feel bad and you're not making me feel good. So you hate me. And they attack the other person like an yeah. enemy. And the saver says, I, you're spending money like an idiot. Why are you doing this to us? You're going to ruin us. You make me feel scared all the time. Every time I look in here, I'm scared because I'm scared to see what you spent money on. This is why do you hate me? And they're enemies. They mm. can't even have that conversation in the middle. Fix the attachment. Cooperate as a team. Have the discussion. Find your comfortable place in the middle, wherever you're, wherever you guys are. Find that comfortable piece. And yes, fix the attachment piece that is overspending and oversaving. Fix that piece. Too. Yeah. And it's again connected to the dopamine, right? But because like spenders get it so much and maybe sometimes savers have it too, but but from g- different kind of activities. Is it is it possible? It can be. They can build a dopamine loop about look how safe I am. Yeah. Look how safe I am. For all of my life, I will be totally safe. That's sometimes that can feed that in and make them feel it releases the cortisol and then releases some it, it it decreases cortisol the stress and then increases dopamine and rewards them for saving 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 and never spending and these are the parents who their kids say dad I need help with medical bills and the dad says you should work harder and he has all this money over yeah. here he doesn't he doesn't want to let go of his safety even for his child. That's a problem too. There is one hormone which you have already talked about. It was about bonding some kind of like we are doing this together and is really that's suppressing that's suppressing yeah something like that exactly so this is this activity like working on financial plan or working on goals and vision where we want to go we want to travel like this it is like even helping the relationship right in other words yes yes it is setting financial goals and meeting them together not meeting them at each other's expense or getting around the spender to meet it but meeting financial goals and making them happen together as a team and then setting new financial goals and setting those goals. It's wonderful bonding to do. Mm. Couples can bond mm. over financial achievements a hundred percent. Cause then, you know, the other person is a teammate. They're an ally. You could trust them. Yeah. It's a great thing. I, I have never thought about it that way. Actually, that it's really like a bonding thing, which can bring so much joy in a relationship. Anna, what about you? Do we invest somehow? Or something. I am in my relationship. I am the spender. <laughs> my <laughs> wife is a careful, careful saver. Not bad. Very careful. So when we met, that was something we had to work on. Was okay, Adam. You like to spend, and how, and I said, yeah, I work hard. I make the money. I'll spend the money. Yeah, and she yeah, said, yeah. yeah, but 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 what about next month? And I went, oh, I didn't think about next month. <laughs> and she is very careful with the spending. So we do. We have our savings. We have actually have two savings accounts for different savings. We have our checking for bills, and then we have more of the fun budget. And we say, okay, how much can we use each month for this piece? And we make sure, okay, are you spending because you're stressed? Let's not do that. Let's give me that card. <laughs> Let's go over here. Both of us sometimes will spend. Even a saver could spend if they get too much stress. Let's go over here. Let's do other things to make sure the stress is taken care of the right way. Let's go for a walk. Let's do things that don't cost money. Let's spend money very carefully. So we've worked together to be both very smart and careful as a team. And yes, that did bond us together very well having to do that. We were very poor when we got together. Not and, and I I made very little and then I spent the little that I had. We had to learn to get together and be very very safe because we have four kids now. 
They are expensive to feed. They yeah, to yeah. School system in America is not cheap. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. And uh, what about like those? Do you invest also money like in some uh, funds or ETF funds or something like that? I have. I am usually very bad at it. Um, uh -huh. I, I, I use. I usually pick the ones. Again, I pick the ones that are like oh, this looks fun. And look, the numbers are going up. Let's invest there. And the moment I invest, it stops. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. looks terrible. My wife very careful she can invest carefully in smart uh -huh. areas and it will go up so yes yes I, bitcoin I, and, and cryptocurrency i do enjoy, enjoy investing in though i'm a long-term holder for those nice. i'm smart there i can be smart there nice nice yeah actually there is no other option right now for anyone just to be long long term uh <laughs> who already well, invested yeah, you, like you one win. one year yeah two years ago <laughs> You just switch your strategy, and yeah, it's long term because you need to diamond win. diamond hands. As they yes, say. yes. Diamond you, better, hands. you better hold on till the market goes up. <laughs> Adam, thank you very much for joining us. For me, even it was very eye opening. It was one of the biggest inspiration talk I have ever had because we covered like different kind of topics for different kind of views. To all our listeners, please go follow Adam on Twitter. Also, AdamLaneSmith.com, consultations, books, whatever, whatever you like, guys. Thank you very much. Thank And you. maybe next time. Absolutely. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Bye-bye.